there was no fooling the children of the revolution, they definitely knew the music they wanted. Strong language now as BBC One takes a step back in time and salutes the kings of glam. It's 1970. Britain is grey. But a shiny Technicolor revolution is about to change all that. In pop music, at least. It was the men who led this teenage rampage. And didn't they look glam? The king of teens. You kind of watch them with your parents, and if everyone's squirming uncomfortably, you know it must be something good. The Chameleon King. When we left, he cut his hair and painted his nails and shaved his eyebrows. <laughs> the King of the Crowd. The other guys in the band, their parents used to say to him, you'll never get anywhere with that singer. All he does is shout. <laughs> the King of Cool. He was a fantastically glamorous figure. And there wasn't a guy in Britain who didn't think, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. The girl who would be king. I had stuck to my guns. I thought, this is where I'm going. I don't care if there's a place for me or not. I'm going to find a place. And the showbiz king. He's got that what I call the killer instinct that a lot of superstars have. It was the 70s, and something was on everyone's lips. S-E-X. Bi, S-E-X. Homo, S-E-X. Hetero, S-E-X. Music, S-E-X. There was a new freedom in the air. Women could act like men, men could dress like women, and this new generation of teenagers were bored by the old hippie tunes on offer. Music spoke about what was going on, and it made, helped me make sense of the world. Hey, good looking... These teams wanted something louder, flashier, and altogether more fun. It was a fantastic time for a lad, because you could actually really, really dress up, and you could still pull women. And the man who led this pop revolution is our first shining star, the king of teens, Mark Bolan. Mark Bolan always knew where he wanted to be, way out in front. What about telling him I have sex five times a day? Do you think they'd go for that? I said, oh, yeah, that sounds good, yes, we'll put that story on. He was gorgeous, very pretty boy, and definitely had his own style, his own image. Dipping into his dressing up box, he introduced the gender-bending thrill that began glam rock. We call it today the X Factor. It's what I call charisma. You can't buy it. You can't teach somebody. He had it, Bubba. Well, I saw my baby walking. With another man today. The young Mark Feld grew up in London's Jewish East End, but the soundtrack to his childhood was pure American rock and roll. I first met Mark Bowen. I was probably about. 12, 13 years old. He was always stood out. He always looked like a star. He don't matter if he'd been an actor, a writer, a singer, or, or, or whatever, a painter. He wanted to be a star bubbler. By 15, Mark was earning money by modelling. You know, he wasn't very wealthy, but he still presented himself. I mean, he was the only guy around town with, you know, 15 suits and five good shirts and a cane. But he was determined to make it big with his music. Mark was desperate to be a star. I, and I was on the New Musical Express at that time as a journalist. Mark would come up and just try to sort of, you know, get a foot in the door. And he would tell us, you know, that he was going to be bigger than the Beatles and bigger than Elvis. And he would literally say things like that. You know, we'd pat him on the head and say, yes, of course you will, Mark. You know, now come back when you're old enough to buy a drink. For the next five years, he drifted between bands. Then in 1967, he teamed up with bongo player Steve Peregrine Took and found a champion in Radio 1 DJ, John Peel. Who's playing here, actually? Well, right now, there's a group called Tyrannosaurus Rex. Mark decided to go out and uh, form his own little group, just the two of them, and it's very beautiful. OK, let's have a look. OK. I 
went to see him because I knew he was going to come and see us. And he was playing at the Lyceum, and there was about three thousand or two and a half thousand people. And he held fifteen hundred. Did it? Okay. <laughs> you know, I like to I like to exaggerate. Anyway, it was packed with what I would call hippies, and he was sitting cross-legged on the stage, strumming away the guitar. It was just very weird. <laughs> But the hippie crowd were never going to get marked to number one. By 1970, he'd given Tyrannosaurus Rex a new image, and kids were dancing to a new sound. He just lost his, what I would call, underground cred audience and suddenly became a little girlie's dream. By harnessing the rock and roll riff of his youth, Mark put the fun back into pop, and T-Rex was born. The formula worked. In March 1971, Mark Bolan was finally where he wanted to be, number one in the charts. La, 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 la. We play for the kids that never saw the Beatles. They're seeing us as those sort of people, you know, because they never saw it, they weren't around them. The average age of the audience is 15. Glam rock had arrived. Hot Love was its first number one, and the press had a new catchphrase. Pop music saved me from my environment. You know, I wanted something else, I wanted something beyond regular life, and I, I got that around about 11 when I first was introduced to Mark Boland and T-Rex, and this mystical thing happened to me where a doorway was open. It just let me know there was something else going on out there. You weren't sure even what it was. You couldn't even give it a name. There's something, the way he would glitter on his face, the way he was kind of effeminate. It's hard to believe now, but it was very shocking at its time. Mark's pantomime stage persona caught everyone's eye. I think everybody's parents were a little bit shocked with feather boas and wearing makeup. Very feminine. June, his wife, was responsible really for his look. I mean, I don't think Mark got that look together. It was all to do with June. When it came to wardrobe and makeup, I think glam stars had had women behind them, egging them on, really. He was kind of a boy girl, you know, or a girl boy, or a boy girl, you know, what? What was he? And that was the fun of glam rock. I'm gonna change it was that squirm factor. You, you kind of watch with, with your parents, and if you, everyone's squirming uncomfortably, you know it must be something good. Certainly, uh, there's been a change in England in two years, and we are part of the change. I mean, guys now can wear makeup, they can shout and scream. Most of my mates, even at 11 or 12, would look at Mark Bolan, and, and you wouldn't think, you know, puff or something like that. You, you'd think, God, he's gonna, he's gonna pull the girls. I wanna be like him. Selling records was all Mark cared about. And now he had a follow-up to write. Yeah, I remember I was walking down the corridor in a hotel and um, he had his room opposite me and he stuck his head out. He said, you got any drums in your room? I said, well, I have, I've actually, I've got a, a snare. He said, I'll bring it down. And he went through this, this get it on. Yeah. And uh, he said, What do you reckon? I said, Yeah, it could, it could be all right. Get It On was Mark's second number one in the UK. T Rex had turned into a pop monster. In the next three years, he would have three number one albums and ten top five hit singles. I remember backstage at Wembley, we did these two concerts for the, the film Born to Boogie, and Ringo Starr was the director of it, and uh, he said, as a Beatle, I've never seen anything like this. He says, those girls are crazy, and they were. Fame and adulation had a noticeable effect on the ambitious star. bigger than anyone could believe at times, and then eventually you start to believe it a little too far, and he already had that in him anyway, with or without it, he already had that confidence and that swagger. He was totally selfish, in a nice way. I mean, I'm not saying he was a bad person, but he was all about me, 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 me all the time, and there was really nothing worth talking about unless it pertained to his career. 
he did he know what he had when he had it at the time? I have to wonder. By 1974, Mark's star was waning. His original teen fans had grown up and moved on. New teenagers were looking for their own heroes. When the T-Rex singles started to sell less, I think that was quite traumatic for him. And the combination of getting quite pudgy and starting to drink too much brandy and starting to do cocaine, I think he just lost his way. You know, um, he was only ever meant to be a star for kind of three years. I had his moment in the sun. I don't think it was ever going to last anymore, but he couldn't handle that. Life's a girl. You know, he was stuck in some kind of teenage dream. And I hope it's gonna last. Put the radio on. And, uh, and last night in the news, and also last night, pop star Mark Boland killed in a car crash. On the 16th of September 1977, Mark Bolan and girlfriend Gloria Jones were involved in a serious car accident. Mark died instantly. My reaction was one of stunned disbelief. And it shook me up a little bit because Mark, apart from being a client, was a, was a friend. I was dancing when I was out.